Good morning, everyone. Um, we're gonna wait a couple of minutes to see if more people log in to the webinar and we'll be back shortly. Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us today for the Embodied Carbon Networks 2019 webinar series. My name is Victoria Herrero Garcia. I am a whole building life cycle assessment analyst for a company based in Denver, Colorado called Ambient Energy. I am very excited to be volunteering for the Embodied Carbon Network as a webinar coordinator, and I will moderate today's session. This is the third session of a six part annual webinar series. We have several exciting speakers joining us today who will outline the barriers and opportunities for taking photosynthetic and low carbon materials to larger projects and more building types of every size. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made publicly available upon its completion. Many of you joining today are already members of the Embodied Carbon Network. Do the, we do have guests in the audience who we invite to learn more and join the network. The Embodied Carbon Network is a communications and knowledge sharing platform that was launched by the Carbon Leadership Forum in January of 2017. The network brings professionals working in or with the building sector together to share news and resources, engage in discussion, and develop educational content. The network has evolved into a vibrant, engaged global community. Today, we have over 521 professionals from across the building sector, academia, nonprofit, and government groups representing 127 cities from about 18 countries across the world. We are brought together under a shared mission to eliminate embodied carbon emissions from the built environment. In order to meet global greenhouse gas emissions targets by 2050. The network comprises 10 subject specific focus groups, which members can join for additional engagement around a topic related to embodied carbon. The Embodied Carbon Network is funded and managed by the Carbon Leadership Forum. The Carbon Leadership Forum is an industry academic collaborative based out of the University of Washington that carries out research, education, and outreach initiatives 
focus on embodied carbon emissions, tracking and reductions. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting the Embodied Carbon Network and its annual webinar series. Again, today's webinar is the first session of a six-part series. Each topic is based on network focus group topics. Network focus group chairs have worked with their groups to identify speakers and um, oops, to identify the speakers and develop the curriculum for each session. Our goal is that each session will not only be use, useful to live participants, but also serve as free educational resources for everyone interested in learning more. Please feel free to share webinar recordings with your colleagues, professional networks, and students. Mention of trade names of, or commercial products does not constitute endorsement or recommendation for use. Please note the options, ideas, products, or data presented by speakers in this session do not represent members of the Embodied Carbon Network or constitute endorsement by the network. Our goal is to, is to introduce topics that could help participants think and talk about building industry strategies for reducing carbon emissions attributed to building materials. A few things to note before we kick off presentations. Presentations will be followed by a 15-minute Q&A session. Please submit your questions through the Zoom chat function. I will track and direct them to the appropriate speakers at the end of the session. If you are an AIA member and in need of educational credits, this course is eligible for live attendees to receive credit. Please email info at embodiedcarbonnetwork.org, your AIA member number and full name. If you miss previous webinar sessions, please visit embodiedcarbonnetwork.org slash webinars to access session recordings. Stay tuned for more information on upcoming webinars. Save the date for session four, happening on Friday, August 16th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. A reminder, reminder also of our ECN quarterly call on July 19th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And today we're, we are joined today by David Arkin. He's a principal at Arkin Tilt Architects. He will be speaking about uh, taking renewables to scale. Andrew Leggy, he's with Havelock Wool. He will be speaking um, about bringing a low carbon insulation product to market. Rafael Esperi with Arab, he has a presentation with the forest or the trees, rethinking timber's carbon footprint. Massey Burke, with the, Colorado, the California Straw Building Association. She will present a case study on the Mahonia um, project. And lastly, we will have um, Craig White, an architect from the UK, presenting um, the six carbon sink. So with that, we will um, introduce David Arkin. David Arkin is an AIA Lead AP and is one of the founders and a co-director of the California Straw Building Association. David and his wife, Anne Tilt, are principals of the Northern California-based firm Arkin Tilt Architects. David is also the Embodied Carbon Network's Renewable Materials Focus Chair, Group Chair and today he will provide introductory remarks and update on focus group activities and the carbon smart palette, materials palette. He will also share some brief comparisons and example of carbon storing materials taken to greater scale. Thank you, um, David. 
Yes, good morning. Thank you. Happy solstice, everyone. Um, we're here to discuss how we can take these carbon storing um, renewable materials to scale. We'll uh, have Andrew discuss um, bringing an insulation product um, onto the market. We'll have an important discussion regarding timber and then a few uh, success stories uh, regarding timber and straw. So our renewables uh, task force has been very busy and I first want to um, thank everyone who is a part of our task force and this is a small sampling of everyone who's joined us and some thank yous uh, specifically to Chris Magwood who has contributed quite a bit of content uh, to Jacob Rakusen and Ace McArlton, um, who have uh, provided materials uh, for the slideshow here today. Francis Yang of Arup has been engaged in this effort, and uh, also especially Aaron McDade and Lindsay Rasmussen at Architecture 2030, who are helping um, us to build, or we are helping them to build, to be more specific, the Carbon Smart Materials Palette, uh, materialspalette.org. This is the primary product of the re Renewable Materials Focus Group. Um, so currently in the works are swatches on glass and gypsum board and also mineral wool, bamboo, and clay. So look forward to those coming online shortly. And of course, um, why is this uh, uh, exciting uh, to us in renewables? Well, uh, we represent the, the materials that are on the left-hand side of um, the zero carbon line. These are actually uh, products and systems that can store carbon. And how do they do this? Um, they do it because they're plants. And plants, uh, by photosynthesis, draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They uh, lock the carbon away in their um, cells and they also um, store some in the soil itself if they're properly uh, managed in their, in their growth. Just to put some scale to this, if all of the grain straw glo grown globally were used in our buildings, we could offset all of the global uh, transportation emissions. So the potential of these materials is huge. And if there's any one takeaway I want to leave you with today, I will paraphrase Michael Pollan and ask you to build shelter, not too big, mostly plants. And there are many plant-based building materials that we can be using and these all tend to be healthier and safer too. Um, just to mention a few of the insulation products and this tends to be where our greatest potential is. Um, um, we have uh, exterior wrap sheathing materials, cork, um, compressed straw, wood fiber board, all commercially available today. Um, just a handful of the many cavity products that are out there. Uh, cellulose, um, we'll hear Andrew uh, go into some detail on sheep's wool, uh, cotton denim, just to make a few. And then there are emerging uh, products uh, such as mushrooms or mycelium um, and root mat and who knows what else uh, we'll be coming up with. Some of the other carbon storing materials uh, to be aware of include bamboo, and uh, just one commercial product worth mentioning is BAMCOR. This is a Sonoma County-based company that takes timber bamboo and creates a, a stud-free cavity wall load-bearing system um, that can then be infilled with uh, any number of insulation products, ideally carbon storing. Uh, hemp herd can be mixed with a lime binder to create hempcrete, and this is a, an example of one of those buildings taken to scale. Um, and of course, uh, wood, uh, and provided that it's uh, the right wood uh, in terms of proper forestry practices, uh, etc. cetera. And, and uh, Raphael will go into some detail on timber today. Uh, of course, cross-laminated timber, um, uh, tall timber uh, is, is emerging, uh, and salvaged and reused wood resources are not to be forgotten uh, in this effort. Um, just a quick example of a comparison uh, from my firm. We were looking at uh, long span truss and compared uh, a wood steel hybrid system to a steel I-beam and the um, difference in the carbon uh, was substantial. And we presented this information to the client along with the aesthetic impacts and they selected the wood hybrid, um, possibly because of the carbon, more likely because of the aesthetics, but nonetheless, uh, these we believe are the, 
the uh, options that uh, designers need to be exploring as we go forward. Um, low, ultra low carbon uh, systems and, and uh, concretes, uh, clay being one of the most ubiquitous uh, is another one worth mentioning. And uh, we'll look forward to that swatch uh, coming online. Variations of these, uh, light straw clay, uh, and of course, uh, straw. And we'll get into some detail here, but I did want to show a few examples of um, buildings from around the world just to back up. Uh, straw bale was invented on the American plains in the turn of the previous century. And like democracy and jazz, it is a uniquely American invention that has been exported worldwide. Um, many benefits uh, to be mentioned here, of course, the high insulation value, uh, remarkably good fire resistance, uh, and it's a user-friendly material um, that uh, can still be taken to scale, but also have great impact um, uh, for, for smaller scale buildings if we do a lot of them. Uh, so just a few examples of projects starting at the residential scale. Uh, this home is a fire survivor. Um, and then to, taking it to public and commercial buildings, a uh, U.S. Forest Service station here in California. Uh, this is a barrel storage room in a winery in Northern California. Uh, Craig White will be discussing um, several of their projects, uh, including uh, this Inspire building in the UK. Uh, one of Chris Magwood's uh, pro projects, which actually ends up with an 86 ton uh, net carbon dioxide storage through the construction of that building. Five stories in the Netherlands uh, by our colleague Renee Dalmeyer. Uh, this is an example under construction in Germany. Uh, the eco cocoon system developed in Lithuania is being uh, exported throughout uh, the, the continental Europe and um, represents a uh, combination of timber and straw in a panelized system. And um, we look forward to uh, one day soon bringing this technology to the States. And last, um, an example that I think is one of the, the best out there so far. This is a seven-story housing project in France, and it features a uh, timber frame construction with uh, panelized uh, straw for insulation. Uh, these panels are in wood fiberboard boxes. And through the combination of wood and straw, the um, uh, those products uh, far offset the concrete and steel that were used in this project to create a carbon storing building at scale. And that is where we hope to go. Um, just to mention a few resources that are uh, currently available. Most if not all of these are familiar to all of you. Um, also want to invite those of you in the Bay Area to come join uh, the California Straw Building Association for a straw bale wrap uh, of an existing building workshop coming up in August. And uh, finally, there is a free download of the uh, residential straw bale construction code uh, available from the CASBA website. And there's also a link there to our new uh, detail book, uh, which we invite you all to explore. And that wraps up my uh, introductory remarks here, Victoria, so we can uh, ask you to take back the helm and introduce our next speaker, please. Thank you, David. Yep, our next speaker is Andrew Leggy. Andrew is founder and managing partner of Havelock Wool. He has a passion for all things in New Zealand, where the company procures its wool. That is mirrored by a desire to affect positive change in the built environment. He has lived and traveled around the world and seeks to leverage those experiences in bringing a biophilic best practice to an industry known to contribute excessive waste to our world. Andrew? Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, thanks so much for giving us a chance to let you all know a little bit more um, about wool insulation uh, by also focusing on how difficult it is to, or it can be, to get 
a new product into the built environment, which is obviously um, quite slow to change. Uh, we are approaching uh, six years. We've learned a lot of um, fun and often difficult lessons. Um, but it's really fun to be able to report that last year was kind of a breakout year for us. And um, we're, seeing, we're, we're continuing to see that um, trend move in our favor, which is to say that the conversations are just getting a lot easier. Um, but for getting a new product into a market, um, you know, that's sort of what we're gonna focus on today. And of course, there's the carbon element to it as well. And that has served us well, because frankly, six years ago, I don't think this discussion was as pervasive as it is today. Um, and it's lucky for us because of the way that uh, wool can contribute in the carbon discussion. But essentially, you know, when you set out on one of these missions, what you're aiming to do is um, identify a problem and see if you can provide a solution. And so that is essentially um, what we set out to do. And by doing that, uh, we were not industry professionals. So we went and talked to a whole bunch of people who had been in the space for a career, uh, both at the architect, builder, and installer level. And essentially what we were hearing is that there are problems with conventional insulation. Um, the, the actual fibers and materials used are, you know, of low integrity. They're emitting particulate, they're off-gassing. Um, people don't like working with them. Um, and essentially, you know, I would say there was somewhat of a race to the bottom perpetuated by this notion that the only thing that insulation could be measured against was cost. Um, and so it really became about a volume play and how quickly can you get, um, you know, from one job to the next. And fortunately, I think we'll get into this a little bit, but I think we've seen that change quite a bit, whereby uh, there seems to now be a very real appreciation for the fact that the envelope should be. Um, looked at a lot more closely, scrutinized, and in fact, maybe even we should spend a little bit more money on the envelope uh, than some of the vanity items on, you know, the interior of a residence or a structure. Um, clearly, as the, the carbon discussion grows, we look at um, uh, contribution to landfill in materials used. Uh, we all know what's going on with Architecture 2030. Um, and this challenge that we face over the next 40 years and the increase of our built environment. And, you know, quite simply, it means that materials matter. Um, and so, you know, with this as a problem, uh, we sort of deemed that we might have a solution. Um, a little bit more on the carbon bit. This is a um, slide that uh, everyone has seen and gives us a sense for, you know, where these um, carbon sinks are versus some of the more problematic materials. No need to spend time here because I think everyone's seen it before. Um, here's a quick look at wool's contribution to the atmospheric cycle and uh, how it sequesters uh, just over half a million tons of atmosphere derived carbon on an annual basis. Uh, this comes to us from the International Wool Textile Organization. Um, by the way, I'll pause here very quickly. We are in the process of having some conversations with um, ThinkStep about um, Cradle to Cradle, LCA, EPD um, for our products, which we're pretty excited about. The preliminary view, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy path, as we all know, but um, the preliminary view is that we might be able to do some things that are kind of interesting based on um, where wool comes from, and then of course the fact that it can be compostable when you're done using it. Um, again, sorry, I, we're not ready for the solution. We have to look at a few more problems. Um, from our perspective and many of our partners, we just don't really understand why this picture on the left happens. Um, and uh, you know that goes from this type of thing happening in a confined space through to how do you get rid of this stuff? Um, and of course, there are performance challenges that go with it as well um, that you know are subject to debate. And then fiberglass, um, you know, don't really love beating up on the competition, but you know, this is a low integrity fiber that um, you know you shouldn't expect it to do much more than um, what it's capable of based on a simple notion of you get what you pay for. 
Um, we'll conversely, if you focus on the images on the right, you know, we're trying to create this biophilic feel, which is frankly a fair bit of biomimicry because we're taking what's going on in this pasture, we're giving the sheep a haircut. This picture on the bottom left is literally 30 seconds off of the wool off the back of um, a sheep. And then, of course, we make our products. And uh, this is from one of our distributors who's uh, daughter was trying to was tired of being in the office and she was cold. So um, we were able to provide a little comfort. Um, quite simply, a wool fiber has evolved across thousands of years as an insulator in nature's R&D department. It has some really cool inherent characteristics like actively managing moisture against 65% relative humidity. That's because of the construct of the fiber and five follicles within it. It's a keratin, so it won't support mold growth. Uh, it's naturally self-extinguishing due to a high nitrogen content. Uh, it's very little known that the amino acids in wool will irreversibly bond with formaldehyde, uh, NOx, and SO2. It's compostable at the end of an extended life. And um, uh, there is, of course, this carbon element that we're all really excited about. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, residence on the left, commercial building in the middle, uh, another residence on the right. Bats, obviously, left and middle, and then blow in uh, to the right side. Our values are 3.6 per inch for bats, 4.3 for blow-in, um, which bats are fairly standard. Uh, blow-in maybe a little bit better than most mediums, uh, save spray foam, of course, which has its really high R value. Um, the other element of the problem that we saw when we kicked off was the marketplace. Uh, we know it changes slowly. We knew that going in, I think, excuse me, maybe we were a little bit naive to think that we could faster than other products. Uh, we learned that we cannot uh, and it takes a long time to you know sort of repeat your message and slowly get people to get on board. Um, I think obviously you know consumers drive the market and that's led manufacturers down the path that they've been on of just competing against cost. Um, I think also that's due to the fact that a lot of these products are fairly low integrity. Um, and then the trade was tough for us. Um, you know, we appreciate everyone's really busy and there's a lot going on. Um, and frankly, we're really excited about groups like the Embodied Carbon Network because it gives us all an opportunity to sort of cut out of the day and talk about the important things going on. Um, but we've had a lot of experiences whereby, you know, we sort of get pushed to the side. Oh, I'll see if I have a client that will go for this or, you know, I'm, I'm in a competitive space as a builder and I can't really think about you know, using a material that nobody sees and costs a whole bunch more. Um, and then the installers are, you know, they're just sort of programmed to go as fast as they can. So, you know, it's important to be able to kind of weather that storm and be able to do the research and, of course, have a product that allows you to, you know, hopefully earn a seat in the discussion. Um, but the other thing that we did, uh, about 18 months ago is we, we, shift a fair bit of, we shifted a fair bit of our focus to consumers. And what we've learned is that there is a high level of demand for the product that we offer. Um, it's just hard to find the people sometimes. But that's all changing and it's now coming full circle because it's so important for us to hopefully be well received by the trade. Um, and because we know now that that demand is there, it just makes for a more um, interesting discussion on both sides. Um, so, you know, a couple of recommendations for anybody thinking about new products into big marketplaces. It's obviously attractive when you look at volume and numbers, but, um, you know, it's really important. Listen to what people say. Be prepared to play the long game. We luckily set ourselves up that way. Um, and um, uh, we're excited about it. We've been able to form relationships with, you know, established groups like 475 High Performance Building Supply, and we've been able to work on putting something together like the Smart Wall or Smart Enclosure System. And frankly, have some fun doing it, where, you know, now we're not just talking about wool insulation, but we're talking about a wall system that can be used, you know, to address very real problems, which are the efficiency of air tightness, um, but allowing that condensation and vapor to move in and out, uh, which of course is, is um, inevitable. So, um, you know, we, um, we try to do the best we can at 
doing research, we want people to use wool, but in the end, we really just want people to make informed decisions. And that's what we spend all day on the phone talking about. Um, you know, I think it's important to be able to understand what the market is telling you and then, you know, shift accordingly. So for us, we've identified carry consumer and that's who we try to speak to all the time. Um, and then we're trying to make the market for the participants that are so important to our success. And that's back in the trade for uh, speaking to architects and builders and of course, installers eventually. But um, it's a long road. It's a lot of fun. Nothing happens um, as quickly as you would like, but frankly, if you've got a really cool product, which is what we have in wool, forget about Havelock wool, it's about a wool fiber being as dynamic as it is, um, then I think you can sort of rest assured that it will, uh, sorry for the pun here, but you'll eventually find a home for what you're trying to do. <laughs> uh, and that's it. That's my 10 minutes. So um, I'll leave it there and, and take any questions. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we are going to introduce now to Rafael Desperi. Rafael is a sustainability consultant for buildings and, and a leader of Arab San Francisco energy and sustainability team. He has facilitated the design of low energy buildings and applied the lead rating systems to numerous commercial and institutional building owners, as well as pioneering sustainability applications in, in transportation projects, especially airports. He contributes to Arab's effort to incorporate the UN Sustainable Development Goals into our business, in, into their business practices and building projects. He's also president of architects, designers, planners for social responsibility where he advocates for human rights in the built environment. He lives and works in San Francisco. Rafael? Thanks for the introduction, Victoria. And I'd also just like to take a moment to uh, recognize some of the other members of Arab's ENS uh, Energy and Sustainability team in San Francisco, some of whom I saw actually on the call today, uh, Francis Yang and Christine Tiffin, and Sarah Tepfer all helped uh, contribute to what we're gonna do here. So I'm actually showing you um, some material, so first stuff that we've been working on with um, Carbon Leadership Forum, and then actually a bunch of work that's come out of a large airport project that we're doing with ZGF Architects in Portland. Um, but I don't really wanna show you the project, it's more about kind of the carbon accounting behind it. But this is in the context of, yeah, people are excited about cross-laminated timber, um, other large timber structures, new changes in fire code related to timber. We're going to use a lot of it and people are saying, well, isn't, you know, we're going to take all of this uh, carbon out of the air, put it in trees, put it in our buildings where it won't biodegrade and isn't that great. And it's a little more complicated than that. So um, this is kind of um, a look at um, the dynamics of carbon where it's stored in the in, in, in forestry practices so kind of a lot of people and when you get an EPD what it basically shows you the first thing is how much energy did it take to produce that wood product and what we're actually looking at is kind of the you know diesel fuel burned in trucks and energy used at, at mills to uh, produce wood which if you look the arrows on this diagram are scaled to the flows here that's actually not where most of the carbon is uh, when people are talking about, well, how much carbon is stored in our products, this is kind of the big discussion and where people are trying usually to focus on, isn't wood great? Because, you know, we're using a fairly small amount to produce it. And look, we're storing a lot more carbon actually in the final products. But if you look around at this diagram, where the carbon actually is, is not in the wood products, but in the vast amount of trees that are living and the soil underneath the forest, like David mentioned, forests are a great example of where the, there's actually more bio, more carbon stored in soil than living trees. And then the layer in between of leaf litter and decaying matter where you know trees are becoming soil. So that's a huge impact. And like I said, if you get a conventional EPD, it's just looking at the fossil fuel use. It would give you this number, kind of you know, 17 megagrams of carbon per year across Oregon, Western Oregon. Um, if you look at the biogenic carbon, that's what's stored in the durable products, that's a bigger number. But the amount of carbon that's stored in the forest is just gigantic. And if you could do something to change even, you know, two, uh, sorry, two hundredths of 1% of what's stored in the forest, you could have as big an impact as all the biogenic carbon that's happening in those forests. So, you, you know, the opportunity to work with forestry is much bigger than the opportunity to work with forest products. This is another way of looking at that. This is, um, 
drawn from a study from EcoTrust, a really important nonprofit doing research and advocacy in the Northwest. They compared kind of business as usual practices, which you can see here about how much carbon is stored in trees. And over time, carbon grows, you cut the forest, you know, then you've taken it out of the forest, it grows again and so on, right? This is business as usual forest. This is sustainable forestry, which they defined as roughly equivalent to FSC practices, which is mostly because FSC requires bigger stream buffers so you have a lot more standing wood per acre and then those trees get older and larger and continue to sequester more carbon over time. And if you can look at the difference between the area under this curve, the area under that curve, as you go on, the amount of carbon that's being stored is much, much bigger. So you know, over here, you could store 36% more carbon per acre by switching from business as usual forestry to FSC forestry. Like I was saying, you know, with 0.03%, you could um, be equivalent to what was in forest products. So the opportunity to work with forestry is really, really big. These are some uh, slides that we put together for our client trying to explain kind of the different ways that people look at it. And I think this is kind of the way that a lot of people had thought about it in the mass timber world even, which is like, you know, here, this is the, uh, the axis here is how much carbon is stored. And the idea is, well, you know, you have carbon in your trees and that's how much total carbon you have. And then the kind of simple story about mass carbon is we took that tree and we turned it into a beam, right, structural member, and the amount of carbon we have is still the same. And then 40 years later, actually, like, you know, if maybe your beam, you, you've deconstructed your building, but, you know, the total carbon stock is going to be the same or maybe even double. That's not that accurate. Because actually, the first thing to realize about the whole forestry process is that when you cut down a tree and, and harvest it, some, up, up to half of it actually stays in the forest. All the little branches that you cut off and stuff, it's called slash. It's burned or it decomposes, so it creates a lot of CO2 emissions. And then when you get to the mill, you debark the log, you burn all that stuff for fuel as well. So you know, up to about half of the carbon stored in a tree becomes emissions when you're on the way to processing wood into wood products. So the, you know, if you looked just at that process, you would say hey, the total carbon stock has actually shrunk quite a bit. We've created quite a, a lot of emissions from wood. Uh, when you look, take the longer term view, which is kind of, which, which, is, which is appropriate because it is an industry that works on harvest cycles of 30 to 40 years. I, do, I would like it to work longer, but like the commercial business as usual is about a 30 to 40 year cycle. What you would find is yes, this is true, but then over time, the tree you cut down, it gets regrown and it's taking CO2 out of the air, not the very same emissions, but the same quantity of emissions to make new material. And then the other thing is over 40 years, some of the durable wood products we've created are gonna get lost because buildings are demolished. You know, not every building has a 40 year life. So there'd be some amount that's a residual biogenic carbon that's there kind of over an entire harvest cycle. Probably the amount of wood that's regrown equals or, or exceeded the amount that was um, emitted. And so at the end of a harvest cycle, you would see that actually you do have, you know, a modest increase in total starred carbon. And that's where kind of, I think, most of the information that you're seeing about why CLT or why mass timber would be a good, good for carbon storage comes from this principle. But the point we're trying to share with our client and with the industry in general is that actually, you know, we're looking in this little box here, right, over the course of the cycle, but actually you're missing the forest, right? Because actually outside of the box that you're looking in is where the forest is happening. Over during harvest, um, trees are also regrowing. Uh, that kind of keeps a steady state. But if you, like we were looking at before, if you have more sustainable forestry practices, you're retaining more trees, you're allowing them to grow older, you're maybe moving, moving to a longer rotation age, you're gonna see the total amount of carbon stored in the trees, also in the uh, forest soil and that leaf litter layer, increase. And if it's, FSC is kind of a shorthand for those practices, but if your project is paying for that premium, then you should be able to account for it as the total carbon stock that's related to your project. And this green bar is what people are missing. It's actually substantially larger than this yellow bar. The question is, how do you communicate this in, in, in a, at the project level? Uh, tally is one of the popular tools for doing environmental uh, life cycle assessment on buildings. It includes the biogenic carbon element by default. You can see that here. You can turn it off so you can see kind of if you feel like there's some reason why you're not, shouldn't be counting that. You can, or, or just you want to know what the impact is, you can do that. Tally does not have a way for you to um, include the FSC element. It takes that biogenic carbon element. It shows you if you look across the life cycle stages, it puts it into the product stage. So that's kind of this, this orange bar here. And you can see kind of the global warming potential for a wood product, product might actually be negative. And that's where you're going to see it. Uh, the reason I want to point that out is that the other kind of, uh, I think, most widely used LCA tool in 
North America is Athena Impact Estimator, which doesn't give you a nice graph. It gives you this uh, output table. It also shows you the global warming potential. Again, it's also only looking at biogenic carbon, but it's putting it in module D called uh, Beyond Building Life. So the, that um, is helpful because it breaks it out more specifically. Tally, you'd have, you know, you can toggle it on and off and kind of compare it here. You can also just look at the module D column. You can see they're not really doing module D for many other impacts on many other materials. So that's Athena that, and Tally, neither of them capture the FSE impact. So what we've been doing, oh, sorry, there they are. Yeah. What we've been doing is, uh, custom calculation, because <laughs> what else is there to do? So this was for this kind of large, about 500,000 square foot roof that we were looking at. Um, and there was a couple of different steel framing options, then, and then one timber option, which we showed to the client two different ways. So um, again, it has the, the timber option has a lot of steel primary framing, but if you include the biogenic carbon, you can see there's a negative um, impact down here from the wood components, glue lamb beams, wood ceiling, wood deck. If you then include Forrester, you can see kind of what the impact was using the numbers from Ecotrust. And again, I should have, should have mentioned that's all regional. You do have to be careful that you're using data from your regions, the Northwest project. So we're using Northwest uh, research, which is good. And you can kind of see the impact of including forestry as opposed to just biogenic carbon of wood, which is actually the wood structural component of the roof is larger. And it, it's kind of the carbon sequestered in the forest that the, that the wood products would have come from is larger than the impact of all the steel primary framing. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, hopefully we'll have some questions later, but I want to hand it on to, uh, I think, is it Craig who's next? Thank you, Rafael. Now we have Massey Matthew. next. Yeah. So Massey Burke, she is the co-director of the California Straw Building Association and a natural materials specialist working in the San Francisco Bay Area. Her work oh centers on research, design, and hands-on implementation of building with low carbon and carbon sequestering natural materials, with a particular interest in developing supply chains and bring, bringing natural materials and carbon sequestering building into the urban fabric. She works with clients, architects, and contractors to design for and manage construction with natural materials. And she partners with organizations like Arab Stop Waste, the Ecological Building Network, the No Regrets Initiative, and Lift Economy to generate technical information and help remove barriers to a scaling up natural carbon sequestering building methods. Macy? Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to take a few minutes and zoom in on a particular building um, to look at some numbers um, that actually represent the capacity uh, for carbon sequestration when you're working with natural materials. Um, I, uh, in partnership with um, Arup, uh, CASBA, the California Straw Building Association, is working on an embodied carbon study for a building called the Mahonia Project. Um, and uh, this um, study is in process, so I'm sharing ballpark numbers with you to give you a sense of the relative impacts of these materials. Um, so this building is uh, a mixed-use building in Oregon designed by Arkintilt Architects, um, and it features various uh, aspects of ecological design, uh, but in particular natural buildings um, uh, used in a commercial, uh, natural materials used in a commercial building, which is somewhat uncommon in the United States. Um, so this building it is uh, constructed of wood framing, uh, but infilled with straw, straw bale insulation and a clay plaster interior finish. Uh, and the exterior is relatively conventional plywood sheathing and steel cladding, as you can see. Uh, another picture of the wall assembly. So two by six framing with straw bales on end in between them. And here are the walls finished with a truth window on the right. So you can see the bales, uh, a clay plaster, uh, which is one of our lowest carbon um, materials finishes, especially for natural materials. Um, some more images of the building for people who are not familiar with what these materials look and feel like. Uh, and then a few numbers. Um, so what we're doing right now uh, will eventually progress to a full um, LCA for the building, but right now it's, we're calling it a carbon study because we're comparing the materials in the wood and straw walls 
uh, and their embodied carbon to what uh, the walls would have um, emitted if they had been built more conventionally. Um, and so some numbers for you. Um, if you just take the emissions of the whole wood straw um, with plywood sheathing and metal cladding assembly uh, without considering the carbon sequestration capacity of the natural materials, um, that the, the component of the building that is made of those materials would have emitted, has emitted 11,640 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Um, when you include the carbon that's sequestered, um, just cradle to gate, um, by the wood and the straw in this building assembly, um, the total sequestration is, as you can see, 44,823 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And so the net sequestration for this component of the building um, is, is in the um, realm of 33,000 kilograms of CO2. So quite a lot. Um, using the Athena impact estimator, we, we um, compared these walls to what would have been uh, the, probably the most similar conventional assembly. Um, and if this building had been built with uh, metal studs and foam insulation, it, uh, these walls would have emitted about 65 tons of carbon, car, uh, carbon dioxide. Mm. So the study uh, is ongoing uh, and still needs to include the overall comparison of the sequestration of the walls with the concrete in the foundation, which of course is considerable, uh, and also um, needs to include end of life um, data for the biogenic carbon in the building. Um, but these numbers give you a basic idea of the possible <coughs> comparative impact of working with carbon sequestering biogenic materials uh, in comparison to their conventional counterparts. Um, and right now, this study is working primarily with the um, Athena EPO calculator, the ICE database, um, and publications such as The New Carbon Architecture, um, which is a recent book that you're probably familiar with by Bruce King, which is looking at the capacity of buildings to store carbon. And that's all I have for today. Thank you, Masi. Our next presenter is Craig White. He's an architect from the UK and the founder of the British Panelized Strobel Wall System, Mod Cell. Craig is a design advice consultant with the Carbon Trust and has worked on the UK's Low Carbon Buildings Program. Most recently, he has launched a new company called Agile Homes and Property. Craig, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a good evening from uh, United Kingdom here. So I just want to uh, share my, my uh, presentation, which is, um, where is it? This is really annoying. So hold on. My mind's not up. I'm not sure. Can you now see my presentation? Not yet. You, not yet. Hold on. I'm just sorry. I thought my uh, thing would swap straight to my presentation. It's not doing that. So uh, I'm going to hit share. Right. Can you now see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I will now go into a slides. Hi. So uh, my name is Craig White. I'm an architect based in the United Kingdom, and I'm going to talk about where we might head with this and why I think other and repeat why others this is important. And my title is called the Sixth Carbon Sink. And while uh, I'm sure most of us are familiar with five, the natural planetary carbon sinks, which are atmosphere, ocean, geology, biosphere, and soils, uh, we're finding that carbon dioxide in the wrong place, for example, in our atmosphere, has unintended consequences. So I believe the built environment will have to become the planet's sixth carbon sink, and that is we can make our built environment out of carbon. And as designers, we work with uh, 
uh, a complex process of trying to optimize our material selection. A lot of design is driven by price only, but if we look at the properties and the performance of materials as designers and engineers, effectively we can work with materials that have properties of mass, conductivity, capacity, and embodied carbon or captured carbon. And uh, thermal mass is important for stabilizing temperatures. Conductivity is important for the speed at which we can prevent heat entering or leaving our buildings. Capacity is the ability for materials to store. And then uh, more importantly today, as we deal with the climate emergency and climate breakdown, we need to understand that uh, part of the problem we have as architects and engineers, we're responsible for 45% of all man-made emissions on the planet through the heating, lighting, ventilating, and uh, the amount of carbons that are emitted through winning, uh, finding, winning, uh, processing materials. I'm not going to go through all of these figures, but they all have amazing and different properties, and as a designer, we can work with them. The key one on the left-hand column at the bottom for embod embodied CEOs, Timber has this negative number, which is to do with the biogenic carbon that others have talked about. The other thing we do is we work very hard on trying to explain things to people because the climate denying world are very happy to say, well, at only 440 parts per million, what's the big deal? It's such a dilute uh, element. So we we try to make sure we can visualize what we're talking about. And we work with a very interesting company, uh, actually based in our offices here in uh, Bristol, in the United Kingdom, called Real World Visuals. And they try to uh, turn the large data and arcane number sets that we work with into something visual. So we call these space hoppers, and that is at a radius of 511 millimeters, that is what atmospheric carbon dioxide would do if we could pump it into a space hopper. We also look at emissions and visualizing those and the difference between why we went from uh, uh, conventional light bulbs uh, making those illegal in Europe now and so we can only work with compact fluorescence and LEDs. So telling the story and making carbon visual is really important. Uh, all of it powered by the sun and if we look at how much uh, a typical uh, what we would call a white pine or European pine species in uh, uh, Europe captures per cubic meter for a white pine species, we capture about 742 kilograms per cubic meter. So uh, mileage varies on this depending on species and density, but most of us as designers are working with similar species and they float around this. Our work is based on uh, the world's largest life cycle analysis of uh, both North American and European timber carried out by an organization called Wood for Good, of which I was a chair for five years and we commissioned that database and I can share the link to that database. Uh, David, Annie and we work with straw. Uh, it takes 40 odd years for a, a, a sustainably managed forest to grow a mature tree from which you can capture one, uh, 742 kilograms of uh, CO2. Straw does it annually, and in some places you can do biannual straw cropping. cropping. And for every um, uh, kilogram of straw, uh, straw captures 1.43 kilograms of CO2. So we have other, as David has pointed out, there's many, many other crop-based materials. So we have uh, intermediate length carbon capture through forestry and very ra rapid cycling uh, carbon capture through straw. We developed a system of prefabrication. One of the challenges uh, with uh, building with organic materials in the United Kingdom, while today it's nice and sunny, uh, we just had one week of rain, the heaviest rainfall in a week. Uh, for, for, for many hundreds of years, all happened last week, and we have floods uh, currently in parts of the UK. You cannot easily scale the prefabrication of straw if you are weather dependent. So we took the idea to take it off site and start prefabricating with an IKEA-like assembly system. So uh, the road to insolvency for prefabrication is paved with uh, 
prefabrication businesses. So we developed a, a system called flying factories, so temporary assembly facilities to uh, be the temporary factories in which we would build uh, prefabricated panels. And you can see there's a John Deere combine harvester in the corner. So these are the components, lime render and straw. And then these are the CNC cut glue lamb timber frames that uh, are pre-drilled, pre-shaped and are friction fit in terms of their accuracy so that we can then build very large uh, structurally load bearing frames. And this is actually, David, this is, these are the panels for that building you showed, uh, one of our buildings that you showed uh, in your presentation. We then uh, do a variety of coatings, which is this, in this case, this is lime render. And so the panels go to site uh, effectively weatherproof as a cold closed panel system. This is then the prototype house that we built with the University of Bath. And we do a lot of research. Uh, architects uh, talk about research, and normally I would categorize that as knowledge gathering, but we do applied research, uh, funded research, uh, with a number of universities, mainly with Professor Pete Walker at the University of Bath. And uh, this is a building that we uh, built uh, with Pete, and uh, it uses cross-laminated timber and lime render, straw, everything we've just seen. So if that's what it looked like when it's finished, this is the amount of atmospheric uh, CO2 captured into all of the materials. Uh, uh, we worked with the uh, ICE database, which was developed at the University of Bath as well. And uh, 34 tons of atmospheric CO2 is the equivalent of 45 years of a domestic photovoltaic array. So it competes very powerfully with uh, renewable energy production. And if you're creating a building that is super insulated using bio-based natural materials, then your requirement for renewable energies is lower as a result of the better platform of the building's performance. Uh, so we're involved with lots of extensive uh, research. These are, we're very fortunate in uh, Europe, uh, while Britain still remains in Europe, uh, to be able to get uh, research uh, funding to decarbonize uh, European construction. Uh, we've been involved in projects called Eurocell, EcoC, and the most recent, which is just finished, is called Isobio. And we work looking at bio-based co- and by-products. Uh, that's a quite specific term. We want to work with materials that arise naturally rather than uh, the equivalent of palm oil, which is displacing conventional farming practices with plantation. Uh, production. So we work with bio-based uh, materials. We've been looking at the variety of different fillers that we can uh, bulk up and make and stabilize these natural materials. And then looking at binders, including lignin, biopolymers, and casein, casein being a milk-based uh, protein uh, binding agent. And then we've been exploring different methods of casting, extruding, rolling, metamorphic, uh, where we can actually apply heat and pressure, and there's some interesting stuff we can do there, and radio frequency, we microwave bio-based products. And we end up producing uh, materials that look like muesli bars, but don't taste as nice. And this is some very early research from about three years ago, where we were able to create materials that we've managed to scale into products. So this is uh, hemp herd, as you call it in the States, we call it, uh, shiv and these are uh, compressed uh, hemp shiv boards combined with hemp fiber insulation. We're lucky enough to have uh, in Europe acquired the technology rights for stramit board as it used to be called, we call it lignocell and this is a metamorphic material where you take heat and pressure and apply it to uh, straw that is ran between two hot plates and we can uh, release the lignin, which is a long chain sticky polymer. And uh, by turning the moisture in the straw to steam, we soften the lignin and we have a self glued, self bonded structural board, which we can build with. 
So this is uh, an Audi A3, 1.6 tons of vehicle, sitting on simply supported straw board uh, with 800 millimeter uh, center supports, no mechanical fixings. And as you can see, the boards are not deflecting. So effectively, it's a high performance natural carbon fiber produced by nature, bonded together using the materials in the product, in straw itself, and then turned into a high performance element that we can start building with. This is the sort of construction that uh, uh, Annie and David are doing in the States and the sort of uh, uh, structures that we do when we're not using lime render to bind. But this is what that system looks like when we swap to compressed straw board. We're able to take out the stud work which would have normally formed the uh, vertical load bearing for the panel and transfer that into effectively sheathing boards, which are actually made of straw board. So we are increasing the amount of straw we're using in our buildings and reducing some reliance on the timber to where uh, we want it best, which is effectively to frame the prefabricated panel. We've certified that build system with the Passive House Institute and you can visit their website and you can download the, uh, all of the data for that system. It's a whole house uh, system that you have to provide if you want to get uh, system certification with the Passive House and you can visit their website and download it uh, from the mud cell part. We've taken that system and developed a new type of agile property. Um, more conventionally known as a caravan and or a mobile home in America. But this is a build system where the floors, walls, roofs and partitions are entirely made out of straw, either chalk straw or the straw board, and then is framed with the uh, timber stud work construction. And this is what it looks like. We're going to go on to build um, 300 of these over the next five years in uh, Bristol. And uh, this effectively becomes a super insulated, triple gaze, low carbon build, uh, building that's made of carbon. So the phrase we use is build with carbon. This is what the interior looks like. Uh, we're using a, what's a product uh, instead of plasterboard. Uh, um, I, you call that jip rock, I think, in the States, uh, but, and the partitions and the door and many parts of this building are actually also built out of straw board. And again, here's a, uh, to finish off, here's a visualization done by real world visuals of what that looks like. So there's that space hopper of one kilogram. So how do we build this up? So the straw insulation, which in this case is chopped straw, is uh, that amount of atmospheric CO2. The compressed straw board is that. The timber structure, the skeletal structure of the frame and the uh, battens that we use are that. And then the uh, UK grown larch cladding is that on the outside. And that gives us a total of 27 tons of atmospheric CO2. These are the gross carbon capture, not the net, uh, where you have to do the LCA on the emissions through construction. And then uh, we were very happy to contribute to uh, uh, Bruce King's The New Carbon Architecture. And this is one of the slides that appear in that book. And this is an uh, um, analysis of uh, what we call a typical timber framed house in the UK on the left, showing its, uh, its net emissions and the amount of carbon captured below zero. Then a timber frame house where we're using much more timber. Then the Lilac Home, which was the bale house you saw earlier, where we're using cross laminated timber and more straw. And then if we were to build Lilac, that uh, the bale house project out of timber, compressed straw board and straw, we will be capturing significantly higher amounts of uh, CO2 into our built environment. And we can very definitely create the sixth carbon sink by designing and working with bio-based materials. That's my talk. So, I presume 
you heard all of that. Thank you, Craig. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so right now we're going to open to Q&A session. And please use the Zoom chat to send up your send up your questions. And uh, we have one right now. Um, this question is for David. And can you talk about the status of seismic testing of a straw-based construction? Uh, yes, certainly. It's a it's a great question and a concern uh, not only you know here in the Western United States but around the world. Um, we have done uh, both out of plane and in plane structural testing of plastered straw bale walls, and uh, they perform uh, quite admirably. I think it's a, a combination of the straw being able to absorb energy, and uh, in the case of a structural plaster skin. Um, the two skins on the outside and the inside perform much like an I-beam. Uh, we did a, a shake table test uh, up at the University of Nevada, Reno, um, that was on behalf of uh, the PAXBAB. It's a Pakistan um, rebuilding effort post-earthquake, and uh, decidedly safer structures can be built uh, using straw bale construction. Thank you, David. Um, we have also a question for Andrew. Um, if you have a limited budget and you will have to make decisions uh, in between where to use a wool product if for um, acoustic versus thermal, ceiling versus wall, uh, what would be your best recommendation for usage when limited budget? Wow, great question. Um, <clears throat> we typically answer that by saying that, um, uh, you know, it's important for people to know that wool doesn't need to be an all or nothing. And some of those advantages, particularly air quality ones, um, can work by, you know, wrapping bedrooms or children's bedrooms or living spaces in the house. Um, this one's a little bit more involved because we're talking about acoustic advantages as well. And so I think it comes down to um, you know, personal preference, obviously, at the, you know, owner level uh, in terms of, you know, what's more important. And frankly, we get it all the time because, you know, because wool is so dynamic and does so many cool things, a lot of times it's important to listen to what the most important element is. For example, we had somebody here recently who kept going on and on and on about the sound advantages of wool insulation. And so it just might be that that becomes more important. And so that's what um, that's the piece that gets devoted to wool, you know, against the limited budget. Um, for me, I would want to make sure that there was some inside of a primary air barrier um, that was interacting with the ambient air for, you know, temperature control and purification purposes. Um, so I think it's really just about kind of sitting down, trying to provide as much of, you know, the the education and cool aspects to wool and helping that person make an informed decision. I, I'm sorry that I can't really answer the question per se, but I think, yeah. you know, what we would try to do is just provide all the information and then help hold that person's hand to making the right decision for them. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have also a question. Um, I think maybe Craig might be the, the best one to answer and David can chime in, chime in as well. Um, so it's kind of like a, a bundle of questions. Um, so how straw is sourced, harvested, if it's done by sustainable harvesting and um, how do you account, account for that? And also includes kind of like an end of life of the product um, that if the, the product keeps storing carbon, how do you account for all these stages? Uh, I'm gonna propose that Massey uh, answer these questions because a lot of uh, the research okay. you've done is focused on this area. Well, I'd love to hear what Craig uh, uh, would say as well, um, but to speak at least to the supply chain for straw, it is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, and it's, um, so I, I wouldn't say that the carbon capture numbers of straw assume a sustainable harvest, but it kind of depends on what you mean by sustainable. 
um, straw for for the calculations that we currently use, straw is considered a byproduct of um, you know wheat production or or other types of grain production, uh, and and that has more to do with where we set the boundary conditions for how we currently talk about straw. Um, straw is actually pretty low impact, even from conventional sources, um, considered strictly by its emissions um, for harvesting. Um, but one thing I'm really interested in doing, and we've begun to do, um, is widen the boundary conditions where you're looking at the whole ecosystem for straw production, uh, very similarly to the way that um, Raphael discussed uh, forestry. Um, ecosystem-based supply chains are really different um, and also provide a greater opportunity for creative positive intervention than, um, than in, in, my, in my opinion than industrial supply chains. Um, so but to answer your question uh, of what we have the opportunity to do um, is um, link up um, you know natural materials and straw in particular uh, in the built environment with the rapidly growing field of regenerative agriculture, which is um, developing straw producing um, agro ecosystems that also are carbon sequestering. So conventional agriculture that's our typical source for straw, uh, produces straw at relatively low impact depending on how you do the accounting, but the whole system is carbon emitting because carbon is stripped from the agricultural soils. Um, whereas regenerative agriculture um, does the reverse. Um, and so it's a, I, it's a straw is pretty low impact no matter what, but it's, there's a gradient that we're still, uh, we could do better than we do right now for straw. So if I, if I can add to that, I think the, uh, the key part here is the byproduct and co-product of uh, the materials uh, we use. So there are some bio-based materials where you, you might have some concerns about why it's growing. So, uh, we are sort of ambivalent about miscanthus because it is grown pretty, which is elephant grass, uh, it grown, grown exclusively as a fuel product. And there are some byproducts that come out of it, but it's preferably grown for its uh, uh, ability to produce heat. So we try to hold on to co and byproducts. And we did uh, a full life cycle analysis with uh, Imperial College London and the University of Surrey, who are host to some of the uh, leading people in Europe on life cycle analysis. And um, the number that they came up with at that, that time, and it will vary depending on the price and value of straw, is that 83% of the impacts are assigned to the value of the product for its primary use. So we grow straw to create wheat to make our daily bread. Uh, and at that time, and of course the price of wheat varies, so it'll always vary, uh, it was that uh, only 17% of the impacts could be assigned to globally or from its planting, harvesting, uh, if there were any uh, uh, nitrates put into the soil to encourage and improve growth. And so the biggest single impact that we saw was something called eutrophication, which is very arcane part of the LCAL world, which is basically the amount of nitrates that seep into watercourses from, from agricultural land. So the downside of using straw uh, was it has a higher eutrophication value than other materials, but it was marginal and, and very, very small impact. So there is a lot of information out there on that. Now, the, the key thing, the question I would ask, and I think you said this, is how is the question framed? Do we accept that uh, growing wheat is unsustainable, and there are some practices that might push it into a boundary condition, or do we need to have a certification system like uh, FSC for co and byproducts of the materials to establish the standards to which we derive, uh, we, we expect our straw to be delivered. So I think it's an interesting question, and we're happy to share our LCA on exclusively on straw to uh, the people who are listening to this. Great, thank you, Craig. Um, we have run out of time for Q&A, so thank you, David. Andrew, Raphael, Massey, and Craig for joining us today and sharing your knowledge 
and insight. This uh, concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them to info at embodiedcarbonnetwork.org. If you have not joined the Embodied Carbon Network yet, sign up today at embodiedcarbonnetwork.org. And you all have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye.